got some uh, some microphone. We've got everything we need. Uh, you shoot me if I go over 20, 22 minutes. Okay, <laughs> Michael J. Uh, thanks for the invitation to the conference. What I'm going to do today, I'm going to talk about uh, um, new approaches uh, for this design of uh, live vaccines against bacterial disease. And not just actually the design part, is what we need to understand and which, which tools we have to understand what we require from a vaccine. Because designing fancy vaccines is easy, but these vaccines don't always work because we don't know what we want them to do. So, um, Choice, rational choice of a vaccine must aim to induce a, a appropriate type of immune response. Not all immune responses are protective, some of them are actually damaging. It has to be directed to the right sides of the body, that's where the bacteria are, and target the right bacteria antigens. So this is the whole of vaccinology in a nutshell. Uh, so what we need to know is the most important thing is how does the pathogen behave in vivo. It's like fighting a war. If you don't know where the enemy is and how it's moving around, you cannot hit it. Then we need to know the antigen specificity and the correlates of protective immunity, so which immune response we need, and also the target population to be vaccinated. Is this children? Is this adults? Are we vaccinating travelers? Are we vaccinating people in Africa and Asia? So we spent uh, the good part of the last 20 years developing systems where we can actually tr accurately track bacteria in the body. And we use combinations of methods, and um, the most recent ones are based on uh, tagged, molecularly tagged bacteria. And I'm going to talk about invasive salmonella diseases as an example, although we do research on lots of other bacteria like Campylobacter, Streptococcus, Haemophilus, Bordetella, and so on and so forth. So what are these? These are um, tagged bacteria which have inserted in their DNA uh, little molecular sequences that then we can read either by PCR and more recently by sequencing. So these are like barcodes that your food at the supermarket has and we can scan them by sequencing and understand which is which. So we use this bacteria which here are coded in color but actually in the, in the real world they're coded with molecular tags and then by we can detect presence, absence, relative proportions, and population heterogeneity in the blood and monitor transfer from blood to the organs, transfer from the organs to the blood. And we can also monitor in the body uh, persistence of the bacteria, whether the bacteria have been killed or whether the bacteria are divided. We use sophisticated mathematical modeling. I know our colleague here is very skeptical of mathematical modeling, but actually, you know, it, uh, it is more useful than you appreciate. And um, so to reconstruct um, the biological system. And we also use fluorescence microscopy to actually see where the bacteria are and count them inside uh, cells. So this is more um, advanced fluorescence microscopy on tissue sections, and we are moving into real-time microscopy as well. So we spend a good, good part of the last 20 years to reconstruct the biological system. And if you think about invasive salmonellosis, what we have learned is that um, when the bacteria invade the body, they infect a resting phagocyte, then the bacteria start growing and the host starts making what um, granuloma-type um, inflammatory lesions, which are clusters of mononuclear cells that migrate at the sites of infection. And this is driven by um, a lot of cytokines and infiltration of cells from the bone marrow. And we have worked out all these. Actually, my lab was the first one to appreciate that cytokines are important in salmonellosis, and then we moved to other things. Uh, so this environment becomes quite nasty for the bacteria because the macrophages start throwing at the bacteria reactive oxygen intermediates, reactive nitrogen intermediates, lysosomal enzyme, and so on and so forth. So the bacteria now have a choice. One is resist or escape. That's what you do if somebody starts to punch you. Um, we are working out now how the bacteria resist. By we have done lots of work on proteomics and transcriptomics to see how the bacteria adapt, and we are publishing a couple of papers in the next six months on this. But then what the bacteria do, they use some genes, like um, a type 3 secretion systems, to inject something into the host cell. So they kill the host cell, and they escape. And they go and infect new phagocytes, which have never seen the bacteria, so they're not immunologically activated. And they force the immune system to restart this process all over again. So it's like a hit and run strategy, or a catch me if you can strategy. I hit, escape, and go to somewhere where they don't know me. So this has allowed us to actually understand what we need from vaccines. Because we need T cell immunity to control this part of the infection, the intracellular part of the infection, but then we need antibodies 
to control the extracellular phase of the infection. And in my lab, we have worked out that actually the way antibody works in, in, in salmonella, systemic salmonellosis, what they do, either they kill the bacteria via complement or they target the bacteria to FC1 receptor on the surface of phagocytes, and that activates the intracellular uh, mechanisms of killing. So it makes these phagocytes that normally are sort of unaware of the bacteria, it makes them a little bit angry, a little bit nasty, a little bit more activated. So what about humans? That is all done in mice. What can we learn from humans? Do we still, so, so this is quite important, sorry, because then we need both antibodies and T cells to control the infection. So one would assume that a vaccine that is highly effective is a vaccine that needs to induce a good antibody response and a good T cell response. And not all vaccines do that. So what about humans? What can we learn from humans? Is it still antibodies and T cells? We can learn a lot by looking at um, immune genetic immunodeficiencies and polymorphism and associations, and we have done that. And actually, if you look at this, higher incidence of um, invasive salmonellosis occurs in uh, patients that have impairment in antibodies, uh, in T-cell mediated immunity, in phagocyte antimicrobial functions like CGG patients, thalassemic patients, and patients which have uh, other deficiency of polymorphism in genes um, for signaling molecules, and cytokine networks, you know, patients with deficiencies in cytokine networks that have higher incidence of salmonellosis. But, you know, this is, is a non-endemic situation. This is more um, in the Western world. What about if we move to really where these diseases are endemic? Um, again, is that dichotomy? We need both antibodies and T cells. Um, why do we know antibody? Invasive salmonellosis are more uh, frequent in young children that do not have antibodies yet, and they have lost the antibodies, the maternal antibodies. So highest incidence is between six and 72 months, typical of those diseases that rely on antibodies for protection. And also dysregulated antibody responses in HIV patients. HIV patients are exclusively susceptible to invasive salmonellosis. And phagocytic functions, you know, malaria, HIV, malnutrition, severe anemia, sickle cell disease, and hookworm that affect other macrophages of T cell immunity um, associate epidemiologically with a higher incidence of uh, invasive salmonellosis. So vaccines, are we really learning anything from all the work that we have done in humans and in mice? Do we really need a vaccine that induces both T cells and antibody? And it is possible with modern technology to produce a vaccine that does this. Now, if we go back to mice and look at how we can intervene on the infection, this is a typical growth curve on an invasive salmonella strain in the spleen and liver of a mouse. The bacteria grow very rapidly. Now, if we only had antibodies or what a kill vaccine would do, because kill vaccines only induce good antibody responses, they don't induce protective T cell responses, all we do, we just decrease the initial, increase the initial killing, so we decrease the amount of bacteria that actually start to grow, but once the bacteria grow, then the antibody doesn't touch them. And even bacteremia is not controlled. Now, this is very antidogmatic because we always thought for decades that in bacterial infections, antibody is su sufficient to control bacteremia. I'm sorry it isn't. If you don't have T cell immunity, bacteremia goes out of control. So what about uh, live attenuated vaccines? We could use live attenuated vaccines because what they do, in, in addition to the antibody response that lowers the initial inoculum, they also induce T cell immunity that can suppress growth and spread of the bacteria and enhance um, killing and suppress bacteremia. So is this true? So we went back to our system where we use the tagged uh, bacterial strains and uh, we used like different setups, okay? where we had um, animals immunized with a live vaccine and then reinfected with this virulent uh, tagged bacteria, animal immunized with a kill vaccine and then challenged with this virulent tagged bacteria, or animals that were immunized with a live vaccine but they were depleted of the T cells before challenge. So these animals would have the antibodies, perfectly good antibodies, but not T cells. And effectively what happened, all in the animals immunized with a live attenuated vaccine we see enhanced killing, control of division in the tissues, control of spread of the bacteria in the body, and control of bacteremia. The kill vaccine only controls the early killing, but when there's no control of the infection, the animal would die. Lay, uh, if you deplete the T cells from a live vaccine, you only are left with the early killing, but you do not control the infection. So you really need T cell immunity and antibody immunity to control um, a vaccine. 
But a lot of the vaccines that have been developed at the moment, they're not live attenuated vaccine, especially for invasive salmonellosis. They are killed vaccines. Uh, so are these vaccines going to work? Now, if we want to use a vaccine that whose efficacy is only based on the antibody response, then we must make sure that that, an that antibody response is damn good. We need to optimize it. So instead of having a little dip here at the beginning, we cause a dramatic decrease in the infecting dose and the infection never starts. Or we need to lower the initial infection to such a level where an unprimed cellular immunity can have the time to get activated and to control the infection. So how can we optimize an antibody response? Uh, we can optimize titers, but I'm not a great believer that more antibodies do a better work. I think there's a threshold. Once you go above that, if you have more antibodies, maybe you protection lasts a bit longer, but uh, I think function doesn't increase. Isotype profile and antigen targets. So I'll show you an example how we know that isotype profile um, can affect the efficacy of an antibody response. Um, just move to humans. Uh, that was an example in mice. What we did in my lab, this work from a PhD student some, some years ago, she used some recombinant human immuno immunoglobulins that have identical D regions, but they have different C regions. So these have identical affinity for the bacteria, but they, have di but they are of different um, isotypes. These are quite easy to make. Now there's a company in Oxford that makes it. It's called Absolute Antibodies. They're very, very good. Uh, in those days, we had to make them ourselves. Um, so what, w uh, so what we did, we optimized bacteria with the individual um, e e subclasses, and then we just fed the bacteria to human phagocytes. And as you can see, this is a test of phagocyte efficiency of a phagocytosis. IgG1 and IgG3 were more efficient than other subclasses. So in principle, it is possible to optimize the antibody response by modulating the isotype profile, which we can do with delivery systems or different, uh, different adjuvants. And this is quite important for vaccinology. Um, so are non-living vaccines then likely to work in the field? Because how much time do I have? Uh, two hours, two hours, two minutes. Uh, so are non-living vaccines likely to work in the field? Because non-living vaccines, they only induce a good antibody <coughs> response. So no matter how good it is, we do really need T cell immunity as well if we want really to be the vaccine to be protective. Uh, this is some work that comes from, uh, from Malawi, from my good friend Tony Miranda. What Tony did, he had a look at the presence or absence of T cell response in very young children, T cell response to salmonella. So here, in the gray bars are the incidence of, uh, in non -in uh, of invasive salmonellosis in the population. As you can see, you get a peak at 13 months and then it decreases as the population acquires antibodies against the bacteria. Okay, these are the antibody titers. Here, they the children receive it from the mother. Then they decrease, and then they go up again. This is either natural exposure to the disease or cross-reactive exposure to other similar bacterial pathogens. It could be E. coli, for example, or some um, other kind of negatives. Uh, surprisingly, these children develop CD4 T cell immunity. At 13, which is very high at 13 months, probably by cross reactive exposure to other pathogens. So, here you have a situation where you've got a peak of incidence of the disease, because, but you have good T cell immunity, but no antibody responses. Okay. So, what we need to do with endemic situations then, all we need to do is just boost this antibody response up to here, and then we will have a situation where we have both antibodies and T cells, and even a kill, and even a kill vaccine can protect. So the fact that kill vaccines are not very protective in mice, when you move them in a situation when there is background immunity and there is a natural exposure and development of T cell immunity, these vaccines have a chance to work. So I'm very, very confident that even kill vaccines can, be, although they're not ideal, can be of some, of some good. But do we really want to put all our eggs in a basket and our money as far as the WHO is concerned? Or do we want um, also to develop live attenuated vaccines? Um, the problem with live attenuated vaccines is that they can be dangerous in immunocompromised individuals, okay? So what we have done, we have started looking for mutations that would make live attenuated vaccines uh, unable to revert to virulence in immunocompromised individuals. So what we did, we did a massive study where we were using um, transposon-mediated mutagenesis, a technique called TRAVIS, where you have input pools of bacteria, which these are sort of mutants, and then we can read where the mutation is, by, by sequencing, and we just put them in different sets of knockout mice that resemble 
um, common immunodeficiencies. This resembles like um, um, uh, deficiencies where you don't have intracellular killing of the bacteria. This is a model for HIV, CD4 negative mice, and these are models of uh, cytokine deficiency, a lack of macrophage activation. And then you can compare the output pool and the, uh, the input pool and the output pool. So you can see which ones of these bacteria survive or are killed in the mouse. And when you compare this to the wild type mouse, then you can determine whether there are mutations that allow the bacteria to still be attenuated in a condition of immunodeficiency. And to make a long story short, and there is my last slide, or one of the last two ones, um, we didn't find a magic bullet. We didn't find a, a, a mutation that stops the bacteria from killing a very immunocompromised mouse. But even using the most stringent level of immunodeficiency, which is the fox mouse, we found some mutants, for example, and CC was one of them, where the animals succumb to infection much later. Now, this is quite significant because, you know, uh, fox, fox mice have what would be the extreme uh, level of the immunodeficiency that malaria induces. But this is extreme because it's genetic. So that mechanism is not impaired. It's not there anymore. And you still have a, a great delay in uh, the appearance of, of symptoms. So this al would allow you, if you go on a vaccination program in endemic areas where um, immunodeficiency and comorbidities are endemic, if a patient comes down with symptoms from the vaccination, that gives you a bigger window in which you can intervene medically and save the life of your vaccinee if things go, um, go wrong. So I'll finish here because I think I've run out of time. Um, what I presented is about 20 years of work from about 30 people. So, you know, this, this, is, this is my current group. And lots of this work has been done in collaboration, obviously. And the main collaborators for this part of the world, uh, work have been the Wellcome Trust Sangley Institute, um, some work we've done with Novartis on, um, on the vaccines, and, um, and Jeff Verbeck in, um, in Leiden um, that has provided us with um, uh, mice that uh, lack FC receptor. So we've done a lot of the work on antibodies and FC receptor on these mice. And thank you very much, and I welcome any questions. We can do the questions at lunchtime. Um, <laughs> I, I guess we can, we can have a question for you now. Okay, um, fine. Um, Is there any? A stupid question, question and an answer. <laughs> so I'll say yes or no. Just to have one. <laughs> 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 the name of Paris for the other two. Yeah. The early protective response, that is uh, mainly macrophages and cytokines. Yeah. If you deplete the T cells, then the animals still survive a few days, but then they die. So there is a lot of uh, innate immunity? Uh, yeah, innate immunity will always be there, whether you've got the T cells or not. Antibody will always be there, whether you've got the T cells. The of the malaria is that it doesn't have a simple mutation, so you have a mutant and then a mutant again. Uh, the way that works, uh, first of all, there are also T cell independent antigens, uh, like lipopolysaccharide, but the way that experiment works, you immunize, let the antibody response develop, and then you deplete the T cells before you reinfect. So the immunity just develops 